Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 15. 1 Samuel, chapter number 15. And if you don't have your Bible this morning, we're going to try to get our, our verses up on the screen this morning, or I'm sure somebody near you wouldn't mind if you looked on. 1 Samuel, chapter 15. And just one verse of Scripture. If you were with us last week, you'll get the context of this. If not, it won't be long. We'll, we'll try to explain what we're talking about. 1 Samuel 15, verse 17. The Bible says, And Samuel the prophet said to Saul the king, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribe of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And if you allow me to paraphrase that verse, and Samuel the prophet said to Saul the king, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the king of Israel? Lord, we pray one final time for the power of God on our time together. Thank you for what you're going to do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's a story that some years ago I shared with you before, but I think it bears repeating. As a child, Jeffrey Marks was a ball boy for the Baltimore Colts. So he grew up around that organization, around its coaches and trainers and players. And he later, as he grew up, he went on to be a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. And apparently it came across the airwaves that they were going to be tearing down Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, the stadium that Jeffrey Marks knew so well that he'd spent so much of his youth in. And when he caught wind of that, he thought that he would write a story on his experience with the Colts and, and particularly, particularly his experience with one player that made a real impact on his life, a gentleman named Joe Ehrman. Joe Ehrman was an All-American football player at Syracuse. He was an all-pro, 13-year NFL veteran. And Joe Ehrman was an individual that was incredibly successful, just a vicious competitor on the field, but a very fun-loving, funny, friendly guy off the field. But something happened in Joe Ehrman's life, and, and Jeffrey Marks found this out after reconnecting with him after all those years. Joe Ehrman's brother, who he loved very dearly, had died. And this event so shattered Joe. It so pulled the rug out from under his life. It left him so incredibly empty that all the money and all the fame and all the accolades and all the accomplishments didn't seem to mean nearly as much. And he went through an incredibly difficult time of soul-searching, but as is so often the case, while Joe, Joe Ehrman was searching for some meaning in life, God Almighty had been searching for him. And he heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. He heard that he was a sinner and that he was broken from the inside, but that God had sent his only son to die on a cross to reconcile us back and to win us back into relationship with him. And Joe Ehrman received Christ as his personal savior, he wound up attending Dallas Theological Seminary, and he became a pastor. And when Jeffrey Marks caught up with Joe Ehrman, he was not only a pastor, he was a high school football coach who was doing a great deal of speaking to young men about genuine masculinity. Joe Ehrman told Jeffrey Marks that he believed in our culture Men had gotten a false sense of what it means to be a man. They had come to the conclusion that masculinity is defined when you're young by your, your uh, accolades on the ball field. And then a little later in life, it was your conquests in the bedroom. And then later on in life, it was your billfold, how much money you made and how successful you were. And, and, and he would speak around the country to coaches in particular about the impact they were making in young men's lives. And... Joe was speaking at the University of Maryland at a coach's clinic, and part of his speech was chronicled in Jeffrey Mark's book, Season of Life. If you get a chance to pick up that book, I believe you should. Joe Ehrman said that when he was five or six years old, 
His father, who was an ex-professional boxer and a traveling stevedore on the Great Lakes, his dad would come back in town every few years. Joe Ehrman vividly remembers when he was five or six years old, his dad taking him down to the basement. And his dad wanting to be sure that his son was growing up to be a real man and was his definition of a real man, one that didn't show weakness, didn't show pain, and was strong. German said that his dad would hold up his hands like this, and at just five or six years old, he'd, he'd have Joe throw these combinations of punches, jabs and hooks, and have him really put his heart into it and his power into it, even as a little boy. And he said that his dad, while doing this exercise to toughen him up, would start slapping his face until the tears were just rolling down his cheeks. And Joe Aramis said his dad would say, you got to be tough in this world. you got to learn how to take a punch just like you give a punch. Don't be a sissy. Don't be a girl. Don't cry. Let's go. And he'd make him continue to punch those hands. And in Season of Life, Joe Ehrman said this, and I'll quote, I think I stood there as a young boy when I knew my father was coming home. I think all, all I wanted my father to do was to walk into my life, embrace me, look me in the eye, and tell me that he loved me. But when he gave me this message that I wasn't quite man enough because of the emotions and the tears, I had this concept that whatever the stuff was that makes up men, somehow God had put all this feminine emotion in me. And I think for young boys, if they feel they don't have the right stuff, they learn to live with the right bluff. I would say, now listen, if you ever wanted to create a professional athlete, it's those basement kind of experiences. Because that would dictate the rest of my adolescent and early adult life. When I went out for high school football, it wasn't about camaraderie. It wasn't about having fun. It wasn't about being part of the school or the community. For me, it was a life and death issue of trying to validate my masculinity. I felt that I validated myself as a man every time I knocked you flat on your back. But I tell you, he writes, or he said, those kind of concepts... They don't make good husbands, they don't make good fathers, they don't make good sons, and they don't make good friends. And if I can add to that this morning, they don't make good kings. In our text today, we are introduced to a man by the name of Saul, and just to encapsulate his life, he was Israel's first superstar. Israel's first king. Listen, he was everything you could want in a leader, smart, handsome. When David is just a little kid out tending his daddy's sheep, Saul is winning victory after victory on the battlefield. And here's the thing, rather than being arrogant, he was this humble, kind, filled with the power of God individual at first. But along the way, something happened to Saul. He changed. He became more concerned about his reputation than he was about his character. He became more concerned with pleasing men than he was with pleasing God. And King Saul, we talked about it last week, became this carefully crafted persona that the real Saul would have to spend all his time promoting and defending and in the end, this caricature, this phony Saul, would cost the real Saul everything. Here's where we went with this last week. Here's, here's what I have come to believe about Saul. He was a man whose greatest struggle could be summed up in one word, shame. Shame. Shame is the fear that you're not good enough. Listen, guilt is I've done something wrong. Shame is I am something wrong. 
Shame is what Joe Ehrman felt in that basement, punching his daddy's hands. It's what he felt on the football field, and it drove him to create, to listen, hide the real him, hide the emotions, hide the pain, hide the brokenness, and cover it with a facade. The guy who wins, the guy who dominates, the guy who will whip you at all costs. And then to defend that reputation for all your worth. Shame. I told you last week, my, my favorite character in the Bible is David, the man after God's own heart. And I have David aspirations, but I got some Saul tendencies. You know what, as I look around this auditorium, some of you, the truth is, I believe all of us are affected by shame. It is part of being a human being. It is part of being from the lineage of Adam and Eve who sinned in the garden, then hid, covered, and defended. But listen, there may be many of you here today. That list of things, that list of attributes I gave last week, did you feel the air go out of the room? You may be here today, and the truth is, you are not okay with you. And when you fail, you tear yourself apart. And listen, that shame will affect everything in your life. Here's where we're going with this series. The title of it, very odd title, The King Who Hated Himself. Here's where we're going. We're going to get this, this panoramic look at the life of Saul where he came from, what drove him, why it ended so badly. And listen, if we can learn some things about what made Saul tick, about how this shame manifested itself, and we can expose all that in our life to the gospel, listen, we are well on our way to becoming people after God's own heart. So it's, this is a good news series. We're going to go through some hard territory to get there. How many of you glad you came this morning? Say amen. All right, take your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel 9. 1 Samuel 9. Let's talk a little bit about Saul's origin. Saul's origin. Verse 1. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becheroth, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice or handsome young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a more handsome, goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Saul, but there's a couple of things we know emphatically. First of all, I think it's fair to say that Saul came from a family of high-level performers. I want you to notice the text, whether this is talking about his great-great-grandpa, I think it also applied to his daddy, said they were mighty men of power. These individuals had been successful. They'd probably made money. They had gained a reputation. And I want to put out a speculation here, but I think it's a well-founded speculation. As we go through our text and as we really get introduced to this individual, I wonder if from very early on in life, Saul wouldn't struggle with letting his performance define his identity. What I do is who I am. Listen, I don't know if he had those basement kind of experiences. I don't know if his dad was abusive. I don't know if he grew up in a family where it was always, why can't you be more like your older brother? Why can't you do this? I don't know. What I do know, listen, is if you have big shame issues, very, very often you caught on to it in your household. Maybe your mom did. Maybe your dad did. And sometimes that manifests itself with somebody who's depressed and anxious and worried. Sometimes it manifests itself with somebody who simply is a high-level performer who never lets their guard down, has high expectations, and if the truth be known, can be very judgmental when you fail. But Saul grows up in this household, and I wonder if he didn't have the same philosophy that, listen, some of you have and that I've had. 
if I perform well, I'll be accepted and I'm good. If I perform poorly, I'll be rejected and I'm garbage. How easy it is, listen, to let it be performance plus approval or the lack thereof equals my identity. I am what you think I am. I am what I do. So here's Saul in, in this circumstance that very easily could have set this up in his heart. Here's the second thing we know. He came from a family of high-level performers. The second thing we know is he was gifted. Josephus was a, a Jewish historian who lived right around the time of Christ. And he wrote a, a secular commentary on kind of all things Jewish. So, so year 2,000 years ago, Josephus wrote this on this text. There was one of the tribe of Benjamin, a man of a good family. He had a son, a young man of a comely countenance and of a tall body. But his understanding and his mind were preferable to what was visible in him. Now, if Josephus, if Josephus was right... He's saying, listen, not only was this dude like physically exceptional, athletic, taller than anybody around him, handsome, you know, the, um, the guy who stands out in school, but that wasn't his strongest virtue. He was smart, man. He was gifted. And here's the thing I want you to see. All of these natural gifts and aptitudes weren't enough to keep Saul from hating himself. Ultimately, listen, shame isn't based on how beautiful you are. It's not based on how smart you are. It's not based on how, how highly you perform. Shame is, despite all those things, I'm not okay with me. And make no mistake, Saul's not okay with Saul. That's his origin. Let's read on. 1 Samuel 9, 3. And the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul, his son, Take now one of the servants with thee and arise. Go seek the donkeys. Okay? So you're on donkey patrol, bro. We've lost them. They're important. Go get them. All right? Daddy sends him out on a mission with a servant to go retrieve the, these animals that were worth quite a bit of money in that economy. And so Saul leaves. And here's kind of the story. They search all through the different tribes, and they can't find these donkeys. So Saul says, hey, Dad's going to get worried about us. Let's get on back. By the way, I think Saul was a people pleaser from his earliest days. He's very concerned about, I don't want Dad to be mad at me. And so he says, let's go back. And the servant says, you know, there's a seer, there's a prophet, just like one village over. Why don't we go see Samuel and see if he knows where the donkeys went? Maybe he'll tell us. So they head out that way. Go to verse 14. Now, a little background for the story. Israel nationally has rejected a theocracy. God, we don't want you to directly rule over us. We want a human king. We want to be like the nations around us. We, we like the way they do their business. We don't want you to be our king. They didn't say that, but that was what God said they were saying. We want a human king, and so God says... Samuel's upset about it, and God says, listen, don't be upset. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Go ahead and give them their king. Now, look at this, verse number 14. How many of you with me? Say amen. And they went up into the city, and when they were coming to the city, behold, Samuel came out against them for to go up to the high place. Now, the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin. Thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cry is coming to me. And in other words, hey, this, this guy who's coming to you, that's the king. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold, the man whom I spake to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is, the prophet's house is. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me into the high place, for you shall eat with me today and tomorrow I will let thee go and will tell thee all that is in thine heart. That's got to be a little daunting, right? Tomorrow I'm going to tell you all that you got going on in there. 
And as for thy donkeys that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind upon them, for they are found. Now listen, and on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on all thy father's house? Buddy, you don't even know it. But God's got massive things in store for you. All of Israel has been waiting on you. And God's about to lift you up. Look at Saul's response. And Saul answered and said, Am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? Why are you saying this? If you read a couple of chapters later, after he's anointed king, he goes and talks to his uncle, and his uncle said, what happened with Samuel? And Saul won't tell him that he was anointed king. If you read a chapter later, when they anoint him as king, they can't find Saul because he goes and hides. Here's the point. This young man who has this shame, he's done his best to carve out some shoes that he can fill. Okay, I, I'll perform here in my little family, in my little village. I, I'll try to keep up the charade. I'm not okay with me, but, but I can at least be this and defend this reputation vigorously. And when Samuel says, no, 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 God has this for you, Saul's terrified. I can't fill those shoes. I can't do that. I'll let everybody down. Listen, I'll fail. Most people who have shame issues are scared to death to fail. A fate worse than death to let people down. Here's what I want you to see, ladies and gentlemen. Listen. For some of you, this whole series hits you right in the heart because you know this is you and you know this is where you're living. That's Saul's background. But here's what I want you to see, and I want you to see it for you today. Look at God's offer. I can't feel these shoes. I can't do it. I can't be that. I can't live up to that. I don't trust myself. I don't even like myself. Look what happens. Chapter 10, verse 1, God's offer. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon Saul's head. And he kissed him. And he said, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? Look at that. Saul, here's the thing, God says. I'm not really looking for your resume. I'm not desperate to know how skilled you are, how good you are, how righteous you are, how much you got it together, because the truth is, all your righteousnesses are as filthy rags to me anyway. Your best day ain't good enough, and the best and brightest of you can't possibly live up to what the living God would ask. I'm not asking you if you're good enough, smart enough, pretty enough, gifted enough. I am declaring you king. I am anointing you king. You are king not because you're good enough, but because I said so. And I'm that gracious, and I'm that good, and I can do it, God says. Friend, you say, I don't know what that has to do with me. Christian, it has everything to do with you. Do you understand? Listen, God doesn't save good people because there ain't any good people to save. The Bible says that, listen, whether you miss it by a mile or miss it by an inch, every human being has missed the mark. Romans says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all missed it. Your best day is not good enough to work you to God. So listen, God looks down and sees us in our sin, and he sends his son, Jesus Christ. Now listen, he lives the perfect life for 33 years that you and I haven't lived. Then he stretches out his arms on the cross and he dies for your sins in your place. He takes your penalty. And they bury him in a borrowed tomb and three days later, death can't hold him. He comes back from the dead and goes back to be with God. You know what salvation is, friend? 
It is God looking down on helpless you and saying, by the blood of Christ, I'm going to wipe away all your wrongness. And by the resurrection of Christ, I'm going to give you all his rightness. <laughs> all your wrongness is gone as far as the east is from the west. The sins you committed yesterday and the ones you're going to do day after tomorrow are under the blood of Christ. And God has taken the rightness of Jesus and hung that around your heart like it belongs to you. And listen, if you're a Christian, it's not because you did anything to deserve it. It is because he has declared you righteous in his sight. Here's where we're going with that. There is nothing in you, Christian, that hasn't already been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Your security is not to be found in how much people love you, but in the reality of how much Jesus loves you right now. You know what anointing is a symbol of through the Old Testament? The Holy Spirit of God. If you know Christ as your Savior, do you understand that God, the Holy Spirit, lives in you? You know why God did that for you? Not because you're good enough, smart enough, pretty enough, right enough. He did it by grace. He did it because he loves you. He did it because he's God and he can. And here's where, what I want you to get. Listen to me. God gives you a new identity. Can you imagine Saul, Saul walks out of there, the oil's still dripping off his head and dripping off his beard, and he says, well, I know I'm not good enough to be king. Wait a second, God just told you you're king. God anointed you. Will you argue with the living God about what you are? Friend, listen, every day you will either embrace the identity, I am what I do, my performance plus people's opinion of me equals my identity. And if you do, you will live a defeated life every single day. Or you will embrace the identity. By the blood of Christ, my sins are gone. By the resurrection of Christ, I have the righteousness of Jesus. He accepts me in the present tense. He loves me right now. I'm a child of the living God here, now. And I'm going to believe it and I'm going to live like it. Every day... From, thence, from after that point, Saul had a choice. Will you accept what God said about you or will you try to perform and gain the approval of men? And tomorrow morning, my friend, you got the same choice. Number two, God offered a new identity. God offered a new joy. Look at chapter 10, verse 9. And it was so that when Saul turned his back to go from Samuel... God gave him another heart. And all those signs, Samuel had said, this and this and this is going to happen to show you, you will be king, you're, you're king, came to pass that day. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met Saul, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. This, this young man, listen, God Almighty fills him up to capacity. You know what Josephus says? That, that when these other people find Saul and Saul's filled with the Spirit, they're like, what is this joy on you that you didn't have before? Here's the thing. Saul experiences, listen, this thing that I, I, can, I can't tell you about. If you've never had it, then I can't describe it. I can try. But I'm telling you, I've had moments with God, and not because I'm right enough or special enough. I've had moments with God that were like liquid joy running down over my heart and head. If you've walked with Christ and you've experienced that, you know what I'm talking about. It is a joy that is so clean and powerful. Nothing can compare to it. I'm telling you, when you have the joy of the Lord, some of that junk that fills your life loses its appeal. You don't care nearly so much about who won the Oscar. You don't care nearly so much about what's going on at the Grammys. The living God just showed up in you, and you've got his joy. Here's the thing. God is saying to him, listen, I'm going to give you a new joy. You can't get it through the approval of people. Christian, if we're not careful, you notice I said we 
we will start looking horizontally for what Christ has already given us vertically. Let me break that down for you. If we're not careful, we will start asking the people and situations around us to be our Savior. Some of you, oh, I love you. You're trying to make your husband your Savior. You're trying to make your wife your Savior. You're trying to make your job your Savior. You're trying to make money your Savior. Jenny and I were listening to a, to a, a talk radio thing after the Cowboys and the Des Bryant and was it a catch and was it not a catch? And let me just tell you, it was a catch. And there was a guy on the radio, he came on a, on, on a talk radio show, and, and he is screaming at the top of his lungs about that call, and the guy starts weeping on the radio. And I laughed at him at first. And then I thought, what a tragedy. That's all he has. Cowboys are his savior. Friend, listen to me. If you're looking to your children to make you happy, you're going to be broke down a lot. If you're expecting that your marriage is going to give you true satisfaction, as good as marriage can be, they can't be your Jesus. If you think more money is going to solve your money problem, which at the bottom of your heart is a, is a desire for satisfaction and joy and fulfillment money can't do that listen paper and steel and plastic can't do that Christianity was always designed to be a connection with the living God that brought so much joy we were empowered to live this life and if you don't get it here you're going to try to get it here here's what God says you don't have to be that old Saul. I'm, de I'm declaring you king. Here's your new identity. And let me fill you up with my joy. And there's, there's something that can sustain you. One final thing. He gives him a new confidence. I'm going to read rapidly because we're going to read chapter 11. Look at chapter 11, verse 1. Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us and we'll serve thee. And Naash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. Get that. This conqueror's coming through. He's been killing people and wiping out nations left and right. And he comes to a portion of Israel, and they say, Hey, we don't want to fight. Let's make a treaty. He says, All right. In typical fashion in that day, they would cut a treaty. They would make sacrifices in blood to seal the treaty. He says, Let's cut a treaty, but I don't want an animal. I want your right eye. This guy's so powerful, he knows he can ask that and probably get it. And he has gotten it. Verse 3, and the elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days' respite that we may send messengers unto all the coasts of Israel, and then if there be no men to save us, we'll come out to thee. If you'll let us send out and see if we can get some help, then, then we're going to do that. And if we can't, we'll serve you. And the guy's so cocky, he says, fine. Verse 4, then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul and told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field. Remember, he is the new king of Israel. He's been anointed king. And Saul said, what aileth the people that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. Look at this. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard these tidings. And his anger was greatly kindled. Well, God never... Wants you to be angry, really? Yeah, he does. But this is a righteous anger, not for his own reputation at this point, for God's glory. Verse 7. And he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them or cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. Hey, just in case you don't want to fight, I'm going to take away your livelihood if you don't, so you better come fight. And they do. 
And when he numbered them in Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000, the men of Judah 30,000. And they said unto the messengers that came, Thus shall you say unto the men of Jabesh-Gilead, Tomorrow by that time the sun be hot, you shall have help. And the messengers came and showed it to the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. We're on our way to the rescue. Therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out to you, and you shall do with us as that seemeth good unto you. And it was so on the morrow, Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the host in the morning watch, and they slew the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it came to pass that they which remained were scattered so that two of them were not left together. And the people said unto Samuel, you see there were some guys who didn't think Saul should be king. People said unto Samuel, who is he that said shall Saul reign over us? Bring those men that we may put them to death. And Saul said, there shall not a man be put to death this day, for today the Lord has wrought salvation in Israel. Then said Samuel to the people, come, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. One more verse. And all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. You know what? God gave him a new confidence. I can't do it. I'm not enough. I don't have the power. But God does. God is enough. God has the power. God can win the victory. And friend, listen to me. He was learning the secret. The secret of Christianity. Not I, but Christ. Not my power, but his spirit. Not my efforts for him, but his work through me. Paul gave two of the most powerful verses in the Bible on this. Listen, I'm almost done. Galatians 2.20. If you've never knew what this text means, hear it in this context. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness came by the law, all the good stuff I could do for God, then Christ is dead in vain. Paul said, I got a resume nine miles long, but it's not enough. And I've learned the secret. This walk is not me trying for God. It is me depending on God. We've seen Saul's background and we've seen God's offer. What would be Saul's response? I'm busted, I'm full of holes, I don't have what it takes, I don't feel very good about myself, and I've fronted, I've had a fake ID, I've tried to permit to pretend I was okay, but this one, too deep for me, too much. No, 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 Saul. I'm going to make you king. I'm going to give you my joy. And I'm going to win the battles through you. And now he's got a choice. What will he do? The only teaser for next week I'll give you is this. Again, the Jewish historian Josephus, talking about that victory, wrote this. This glorious action was done by Saul and was related with great commendation of him to all the Hebrews. And events gained a wonderful reputation for his valor. So the people were greatly pleased at the excellent performance of Saul and they rejoiced that they had made him king and for somebody with shame issues sometimes the only thing worse than rejection is a flood of approval because he just got his first shot of heroin he's faced with a choice 
Will I perform for the approval of men, hiding my shame? Or will I trust what only Christ can be and do? Will I let his identity be my identity? His power be my power? His love be my life? You know what, y'all? Listen. There it goes. I don't know that song. I would have sung it. You know what? Tomorrow morning, every single one of us will make that choice. Let's all stand. You've listened so attentively, and I'm, I'm always grateful for that. And I know when we walk into a place like this, man, we're coming from 400 different scenarios and different life circumstances and all that, but every single one of us in our own way has struggled with this one. And man, God put it on my heart so strong this morning. There's somebody here today. You don't know God yet. It's so all you've had was trying to find some joy, trying to find some life, trying to perform at a level high enough to get some love, trying to look good enough, act smart enough, work hard enough to be somebody that people can love. But listen, I say to you today, how we love you, how we are that you've come, there's a God who's not waiting on your resume. He loves you now. He loves you so much now, he sent his son down to a cross for you. And he will bring you back into the family, back into his embrace. There's not a thing you can do to earn it. You know what you can do? You can ask for it. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. I got nothing to give you, Lord. But if you love me that much, I'll take it. Christ be mine. Some of you today, today, today need to nail that down. You may want to come down to an altar and nail that down. You may need to, to talk to me after. I'll be at the back and say, I need to talk this week when I have some more time. It's fantastic. Today, you may be at a point, you already know the gospel is just time for you to receive it and accept Christ. And Christians, there's a bunch of us. You walked in here flat and miserable today. Because your life with all of its attainments and accolades is incredibly dissatisfying. Once you bring that to Jesus, once you get real with him today, once you draw close to him and see if he won't draw right back close to you. I'm going to pray. These altars are open. If you need to come and pray, if you need to come talk to a counselor, whatever the need, we're going to have this time where we just meet with God, this quiet time where we do business with a living God. Father, we thank you for your great goodness to us. We don't deserve a bit of it, and yet you offer it so freely. God, how prone we are to define ourselves with external standards, to look for affirmation horizontally and not vertically, when all the while you offer life and identity and power. God, help us tomorrow morning. Help us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.